So yes, um, <clears throat> I am Finnish. I have a funny Finnish name, Matti. Uh, uh, I'll be talking about deduplicating document collections using locally sensitive hashing. Uh, the project is available on GitHub uh, at that address. There's my Twitter account. If you want to tweet at me, uh, please do so. Uh, just before I start, a short introduction, a few words about myself. I handed in my PhD in January. Whoop, whoop. Uh, I am currently working in Berlin for a company called Contravo. Uh, if you would like to move to Berlin, we are looking for developers. Two people to join the data science team. Uh, and finally, I'm also an organizer for Pi Data Berlin. Uh, there's a conference in July, so if you do end up working for Contravo in Berlin, you don't lose all this lovely Pi Data stuff. We have an equally lovely community in Berlin. Uh, the tickets for Pi Data Berlin went online Friday. Okay, that's enough about me. So let's get back to the topic, uh, locality sensitive hashing. And since we are in London, let's say that we run a investment bank uh, that of course uses fancy NLP technology and pulls in a lot of content from online, various different sources, news articles and blog posts and financial reports and so on and so on. Uh, these are fed into some algorithm, magic AI box, uh, that infers what the market is going to be doing, and we make lots of money. Now, the problem is that our fancy new algorithm, or the crawler, rather, has found some number of documents from various different sources over time, uh, and then we find a new document. But because our algorithm is rather expensive, we want to know if this document is actually the same as any of these documents. Um, the problem is that in order to do that, if they're, if they're exactly the same, we don't have any problem. We can just hash the two documents or whatever documents. And if the hashes are the same, then the documents are the same. But the problem is that if the documents are not exactly precisely the same on the byte level, then hashing won't do anything for you. If someone has added the name of an author or a little leading paragraph or something, then the hashes won't match and you have a problem. Now you have to compare the new document with everything that you have before. And then the next new document again to everything you have before. This is not scalable. The solution is going to be presented soon, but before we before that, uh, let's sort of I'll, I'll shortly go over where these near duplicate documents come from. So we're not talking about exact, precise duplicates, but just documents that are almost exactly the same, but not quite. This is one source: editorial correction. So this is an example: uh, two different articles, which are exactly the same article. This is from the Reuters corpus. Uh, it's about 800,000 documents collected over a year. Uh, and you can see that the article on the left and the article on the right are actually the same thing, but there's just a few typos that have been corrected. Just enough to make the hashes the different on the byte level. The articles have two different IDs, so they are, so from an identity perspective, two separate things in the data set. Same thing here, you have uh, various different sort of content federation networks online. Uh, also, uh, content marketing is nowadays becoming a thing. Uh, so this is uh, the original article on Project Syndicate. Uh, and notice this uh, leading paragraph that I've highlighted in green. If you look at the federated content, so some other publisher has pulled this article from the original publishing website and then done this. That leading paragraph is missing, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that isn't in the original one. The article itself is exactly the same. It's just that the one, that one paragraph isn't there anymore. And the same applies for things like content marketing, where you have a company will write a, an editorial, push it to their internal CMS, content management system, and then from there, 
it'll be distributed to Reddit and Slashdot and Medium and maybe the New York Times with tiny little variations so that it matches the sort of tone of voice for that particular publication. The content is essentially exactly the same, but there's just slight variations in the way things are expressed. And then there's the difficult cases like this. This is an example from the uh, from Quora uh, similar questions data set. This was a Kaggle competition uh, about a year ago. What are the best ways to learn French? How do I learn French genders? Now, pff, is that a duplicate? question, is that, you know, is that asking the same thing? I'm not exactly sure. Um, the locality sensitive hashing, when it comes to sort of semantic similarity, that's where the locality sensitive hashing starts to fail because it is essentially using sort of string level comparison methods. Um, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end. Okay, so why are duplicate documents a problem? Well, first of all, you have increased storage requirements, and with that comes increased storage costs. Uh, if any kind of algorithm you need to run on your data set, that algorithm is going to take longer to run. Uh, if you need to move the data sets around, the transfer time goes up. Uh, you also have a skewed data distribution, both if you have, you have an incorrect understanding of how many documents there are in the world, if you're trying to train, say, a language model, the sort of the, the language patterns that you see are going to be sort of incorrect because of these duplicated documents. You're going to have a false understanding of how common certain word pairs are, for instance, because they're just duplicated in your data set. Uh, if you're training some supervised classification models or supervised machine learning models, you can also end up with inconsistent document labels. This actually happened to us now in the PyData Berlin 2018 uh, when we were putting the program together. Uh, we had one author submitted the same submission, the same talk twice uh, with like, I think they removed the, the company name from the title for the second submission and added a sentence or more explanation of something. It was essentially the same thing. One of our reviewers, the same reviewer, gave a plus one for one submission and a minus one for the other. <laughs> uh, so this is a real problem. Uh, and of course also you have wasted annotation effort, um, depending a little bit on how expensive your annotation scheme is, this may or may not be an issue. Okay, so what do we need? We need some document representation, any, doesn't matter which one, just some. Ideally, that document representation would have predictable space requirements. It would be nice to know, sort of roughly speaking, if we add 100 million documents, what is our database size going to be, roughly. Uh, more importantly, we need then some document comparison method, again, some. Uh, but that document comparison method should have scalable computational cost. If it scales exponentially with the number of documents, well then you can't do it. Doesn't matter how well you parallelize, you're going to be dead at some point. Uh, some possible approaches, uh, set similarity of strings, which is what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, you can also treat the duplication, deduplication as a classification task. Uh, this is what most of the uh, approaches for the Kaggle for the Kaggle Quora competition were about. You can also do things like try to use word vectors and do distributional composition of those vectors and then, I don't know, embed everything into a semantic vector space and do nearest neighbor search and blah, 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 blah. The problem is that all of these, including the set similarity, require comparisons between all pairs. But I'll sort of work through that and then flip it on its head and then we don't need all pairs comparisons anymore. So what is our document representation? Or what is the document representation that I'm proposing? Character shingles. So these are uh, just overlapping, partially overlapping sets of characters. Here's a function, it takes a string, Here's our sentence, the cat sat on the chair, uh, or that's our document, and you run it through the shingling, uh, shingling, and then you get these just overlapping 
sets of characters. Here's another document. The cat sat on the sofa. The documents are relatively similar to each other. Those are the singles for that document. And then we're going to use jacquard similarity to compare the, those two sets with each other. Uh, and the similarity for these two sets is 71.4%. Yay. Uh, now, if we take that approach and we apply it to the example that you saw before, with an n-gram, with a character n-gram size of six, we get a similarity of about 89%. Good. Any questions? Yeah. So, so remember from a very distant past, mm -hmm. um, that you can do some tricking that with a regression algorithm. So you, you can, for example, still transform, let, for example, the data compression. So you, you have the hash of the compression algorithm, and you can use Possibly, I don't know about that. Okay, so we can do this, and this looks sort of 89% similarity. Seems okay. Uh, but we're still doing all pass comparisons, so how do we get rid of that? Locality sensitive hashing and min hashing is the answer. But in order to sort of think about how to get that done, we need to go back and think about what, what is it that Jacquard similarity actually is? What is it that we're trying to model? And this is the usual sort of representation of Jacquard similarity. So we have two sets, A and B, uh, and then we have the area where those two sets overlap. It's the set of elements that those two sets have in common. And Jacquard similarity is just the ratio between the purple area and then the combined area of the two. Or if you are mathematically inclined, that. Um, now we're gonna develop a kind of a stochastic process that simulates Jacquard similarity because we don't want to compute uh, this for all pairs of documents. We, we would need both documents A and B. We don't wanna do that. We want some stochastic process that allows us to do this, but in a probabilistic manner. So we're gonna play a game of darts. And the board here, or this Jacquard similarity visualization is our dartboard, and I will throw darts at the board. My aim is very bad, so bad in fact that it is random. Uh, and when I throw a dart, it lands somewhere. This one happened to land in the orange area for B. It is not in the overlap for of the two sets. So we'll mark it as a not collision. We're not gonna worry about what collision means at this point, uh, but we'll just mark it as a not collision. Uh, and you're very um, <clears throat> sort of friendly towards me, so because I didn't sort of, my aim is very bad, so I get to throw another dart. There's another dart that landed in the overlap. We mark it as a collision, and we keep going, and we keep going, and we keep going. Uh, and over time, we accumulate darts on the board and collisions and not collisions. And I haven't really done anything particularly interesting at this point, um, but I hope we can all agree that if I keep throwing darts at the board and we count sort of the, the ratio between the collisions and the overall number of darts thrown, uh, that ratio will eventually converge to the true Jacquard similarity. Okay, so now we have a stochastic process that we can use, but we still haven't gotten rid of the second document. Uh, so let's go back to our documents, because in the end we don't actually have darts, we have character shingles, here they are. We have document one and document two. Here's just a small sample of the uh, shingles that you have in both documents. Some of them are shared between the two, like these first three here, and some of them exist only in one. Now, we're gonna translate the random process before me throwing darts at the board uh, into a slightly different random process that works on this representation, on this data. And that's gonna be a hash function. Now, as long as our hash function behaves nicely, i.e. it distributes the hashes that it gives us nicely across the entire uh, hash space, 
uh, it'll more or less simulate my random aim. Uh, so we'll run one of the shingles through, the, through our hash function and we get back a number, 13. Then we run all of the shingles in document one through that same hash function. And we now have replaced our document representation of sets of shingles with a set of numbers. Now we're interested in compressing that representation. We don't want to work with a set of numbers. We just want one number, one number. Um, and that number is going to be the, we'll just take whatever is the lowest value of those hashes that we got for the document. And we'll replace the entire document representation with just that lowest value. There we go, the lowest value was seven. And then we do the exact same thing with the exact same hash function. The hash function can be arbitrary, any, but it has to be the same for both documents. And we apply the same hash function also to the second document. And we again get some numbers and because the, it is the same hash function, these three will of course give us the same number, but then there are some shingles that were not present in the first document but we'll hash those anyway. Now, time for audience participation. What is the probability that the minimum value for the second document is the same as the minimum value for the first document? It is equal to the Jacquard similarity of the two sets. It's a good question. Um, that's the part that is super difficult to explain. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to skip over that. So, sorry, yeah. That's kind of where the Dart analogy fails. <laughs> um, yes, in a, in, in a way, yes. Because the idea is that the, so the random sort of throwing of the Dart is kind of the same thing as the hash function. The problem is that if you sort of now try to think about throwing the Dart, then like that, because the hash function has to be the same for the two documents but I can't sort of fix the parameters of me throwing the dart for the two documents. That, like, that becomes a little bit problematic. Um, but the idea is that the, so the, the, the hash function sort of just gives you some whatever number out of each of the shingles. And as long as that hash function distributes all of, all of what it does, nicely across the entire hash space, whether it's a 16-bit or 32-bit, whatever hash space, then it'll, it'll, sort of, it'll be kind of similar to that random process of throwing darts. Uh, okay, so the probability that that number is the same for the two documents is, it turns out, equal to the Jacquard similarity. There's a few important points here. Notice that when we hashed, when we created the hashes for the first document, we don't need the second document. We just, we, the, no knowledge of any other document needs to exist when you're creating the hashes for any other document. So you don't need to do all pairs comparisons anymore. You just hash whatever you have in the document. And if the hashes collide, well then the documents are the same. Okay, that's kind of, that's nice, but that's just one hash, and it may or may not provide a collision. In this particular case, because the documents are 71% similar, it'll, pro it'll have a hash collision with a probability of 71%. Uh, but in order to sort of make that entire process a little bit more robust, we don't just use one arbitrary hash function, we use multiple. Uh, and we create 
a document representation called, the finger, called a fingerprint uh, that contains the minimum hash values or the lowest hash values uh, over, the set, over, a, over a document uh, for multiple different hash functions. So this is now, notice that this is all the same document. This is all just document one. Uh, and we have several different hash functions. We apply each hash function multiple times to the same document and every single time we get some different minimum value out of that set of hashes, uh, out of that set of shingles. Uh, and that becomes our document representation. Then what happens is we take the, so let's say that there's, I don't know, 100 hash functions that we apply. Um, now that 100 hash functions coming back to the throwing darts is equal to throwing 100 darts. Obviously the more darts we throw, the closer our approximation is going to be to the true Jacquard similarity. The similar thing applies here. The more hash functions you apply, the longer your document fingerprint is, the better your chances are going to be of finding the actual similar documents that you're looking for. Uh, and then there's one sort of final step, which is that you take, you create sort of buckets or bands out of this, uh, out of this fingerprint. So let's say we have 100 hashes. Uh, and we take 10 bands, so we split those 100 hashes, that 100, uh, 100 hash fingerprint, into 10 sections, and each section we will now use as an index to a hash table. That hash table is going to contain document one, and if any other document lands in that same sort of key uh, in the hash table, then those two documents are then considered to be candidate duplicates. The rest is kind of up to you. If you want to compute the actual correct exact Jacquard similarity of those candidate duplicates, go ahead. This method gives you a kind of probabilistic guarantee that you will find similar documents up to some threshold. So the idea with locality sensitive hashing and, and min hashing is to turn a kind of deterministic similarity function like Jacquard similarity into a probabilistic hash collision. There's quite a lot of maths behind this. I haven't invented any of this. Uh, there's a very good book by uh, Jura Leskovec called Mining Massive Datasets that's free available online uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a much more detailed explanation there on how this works uh, including references. Uh, I have some references also on the next slide. Uh, anyway, so okay, so the general process of doing this is to create document fingerprints that are these min hash values of some length n random min hash functions. The more you have, the better your chances are at finding those similar documents. You split the fingerprints into k buckets. Documents that land in the same bucket are then considered to be candidate duplicates. The rest is up to you. Uh, this is, I wrote a library called LSH, or PyLSH, if you will. Uh, this is not yet in pip installable. I wanted to get that done by the talk, but I didn't. Uh, you can install it directly from the GitHub repo, though. Uh, the slow parts are written in Cython, uh, most of it is in Python. Um, a friend of mine told me that he's using it in production, but I'm not sure if you want to do that quite yet. There's a few rough, there's a few rough edges there. There's the, this currently just works on an in-memory dictionary as the backend database. Uh, I'm working on a branch at the moment to sort of include a uh, some kind of on-file data store as well. Uh, currently SQLite, but once that API is done, you can then, I don't know, use Mongo or Cassandra, whatever you want. Um, pull requests are very welcome. Uh, there's another library, this data sketch library. Uh, also, whoop, let's not do that. 
Data Sketch Library also contains an implementation of MinHash. Uh, I found it just four, three, four days ago, so I haven't had time to actually look at how it works. Uh, it is written all in Python, so it's likely to be a little bit slower than LSH, but the Data Sketch Library has a lot more uh, sort of various different other methods as well in addition to MinHash. So it turns out that the the locality sensitive hashing, if you, if you swap out minhash, which computes specifically the jacquard similarity for a different hash function, you end up getting cosine similarity. Yay. Uh, this process is again explained in the mining massive data sets uh, book. So I highly recommend looking at that. Chapter three. Uh, the original paper on all of this was presented in 97, so this is by far not a new thing. Uh, if you want to look at the uh, if you want to look at the uh, the research on this, there's the papers. I wrote a blog post quite a while ago on this particular method, uh, and there's an explanation here. So if you're interested in how you want how to set the parameters. How many hashes do you want to take? And what is the number of bands that you need to split those hashes into? Here's a graph that shows you if you have a jacquard similarity between two sets of, say, 80%, and you want an 80% probability of finding those 80% similar documents, well, then that's how you need to set the parameters. Uh, that's that's what's quite nice about this method that it gives you like you don't need to do parameter search you don't need to learn any weights or anything like that you just sort of look at your problem and you go like hmm this is kind of what I need to find so this is how I need to set the parameters and then it works uh, if you want to read more about handling duplicate questions on Stack Overflow or, the, or you want to look at the Quora duplicate questions data set, there's the links. Thank you for listening. Great talk, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so you want to have, I assume, as many hashing functions as possible because that's more darts, effectively, right? But could yeah. you get, could you get twice as many darts by looking at both the min and the max, or even quantiles of of the, the hash that you get? Yeah, I suppose you could. I mean, it doesn't really matter that. I mean, the method is called min hash, but that's a kind of an arbitrary thing. It doesn't matter that you take the lowest value in the set you could just as well take the maximum value in the set and it doesn't, it sort of ends up producing the same thing. But um, yeah, so I, I suppose you could. But you get, you get more, uh, you get more data for free by having fewer hash and like min and max together. You combine those two. Possibly, I'm not sure about that. Thank you for the talk. That was a very clear explanation of min hash. <laughs> Uh, what if instead of taking the min, the min, I would hash all those shingles and put it in a hash t in, a, in a table, and then look at cosine similarity between those 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 shingles? Like use basically use use one hash as as a signature. Uh, I'm not sure. I get what you what you're asking. I mean, right, if you, you take one of those. One of those lines, you don't take the mean, you store this line. The problem is that you need to then compare all documents with all other documents. All right, that's the answer, of course. Because you don't, so, because the, the point is that you want something that will sort of probabilistically give you a collision. Okay. Other questions? Left, yeah. Uh, how much faster is it than just? doing the stupid Jakar for, say, like a Reuters corpus? That's really difficult to say because it, it, it depends on a couple of things. It depends on what your data looks like, mm -hmm. like how similar are the documents that you're looking for, how you set the parameters. Uh, so it's also a little bit difficult to say. Like, obviously, if you do all pairs comparisons, just, just that's n squared. 
So you can you definitely know how many comparisons you need to make. But with this, because you sort of get probabilistic collisions, it's a little bit difficult to estimate exactly how many comparisons you need to make. Uh, you need to look at the parameters and then sort of try to, from those, think about, I'm going to get approximately this many, uh, this many sort of collisions and, and therefore this many comparisons between documents. Was it like n log n or something? Like <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> So have you thought about how we, would you evaluate this, um, not in terms of, of efficiency, in terms of effectiveness? Because mm -hmm. um, you know there are a lot of academic papers yeah. looking at this, but they don't consider like the operational aspect of this. Because you want to run this in production. Uh, is the, on are, a you, are you asking if they compare, or are you asserting that they don't do that? My my understanding is they don't. And, um, There's a paper, so hold on. Yes, this finding near duplicate web pages, large scale evaluation of algorithms, actually does exactly that. It's a paper from Google, uh, and they look at minhash, uh, and that I forget what the hashing function is for cosine similarity. They compare how those perform in like a real production environment, given what your kind of business needs are. Uh, and then actually develop a third hashing function, which is a combination of the two. But yeah, sorry, that, what, did, does that answer your question? No, yeah. Or? yeah, yeah, good. And so I have actually, yeah, so there's a few issues that I didn't mention that you need to sort of be aware of. Obviously, this is going to be sensitive to both the length of the documents, but also to the, the, to the size of the character engram that you're using, or the size of the shingle. So here you have the same document, or the same pairs of documents three times, but just if you change the size of the character engram, you get very different results out of the algorithm. The same thing is true if you just add some random data to your document, because this, like, this doc, these two is the same pair as these two, it's just that the latter two have some random stuff added to them. But because that random stuff increases the number of hashes, it grows, the sets are now bigger, then that changes how the, how the comparison, how the maths end up working out. Uh, and you need to be sort of, if you wanna apply this to your data set, you need to first look at the data and go like, ah, okay, this is sort of the kinds of similarities that I get for the kinds of documents that matter to me as duplicates. Because it's also not clear what exactly is a duplicate and what isn't. I mean, again, if they are the same on the byte level, then yeah, okay, fine. But if they're just sort of somewhat similar, then it becomes a little bit more iffy. Um, I think I had a few, yeah, you can't really read that. Uh, yes. So here's a few examples. I guess I should do this instead. Uh, I looked at the Reuters corpus, and sort of here's two documents that are duplicates. They're 88% similar. And it's like, I can't sort of quickly reading through that find where the, where's the difference. Maybe it's just some editorial correction. But then you might, you can also end up with situations, for instance, in the Reuters corpus, you have lots of kind of financial reports of just, here's what happened last week in the stock market. And the, it's, a, it's a kind of a boilerplate article, but the numbers in the data table change but that then ends up sort of sometimes with the Jacquard similarity ends up being very, very similar for those, or very high for those, those kinds of documents. So you need to be aware of what your data is. You can't just sort of go, there you go. Other questions, yes? Uh, 
thanks. Very good talk. Um, is there any mileage in sort of combining this with some sort of semantic analysis like uh, LDA um, to get a categorization of different documents and yeah. then running this only on documents within the same category yeah. to reduce the number of false positives? Uh, yeah, absolutely, you could do that. I mean, the main, the main purpose of this is to cut down the number of comparisons that you need to make. It isn't really, like, the point isn't really to actually find the duplicates. That's, up, that's still up to you. This is just a way to get to sort of cut down on the set of documents that you look at when you have some query document and you go like, hmm, well, what are sort of roughly similar documents to this one? Ah, it's not the entire data set that I need to look at. It's just these 10 documents, and then you can do some semantic comparison, if you will. Uh, but yeah, I suppose you can also flip that around and go like, well, I'm only going to hash the documents that are already, I don't know, that have a high probability on a particular topic for LDA, for instance. Yeah. Um, this might be a bit of a crazy idea, but instead of using um, 100 hash functions, could you salt your uh, shingles with some sort of um, string um, and then apply this uh, one hash function but to like multiple salted strings so that you get um, a similar embedding? Yeah, off the top of my head, yes, but I, what, what would be the purpose of that? Um, that well, I, I suppose. I mean, it's like as, as far as like, like yes, but sort of now thinking about it, it seems to me like it would do the exact same thing of just having multiple hash functions. Yes, but um, you could you could you could have um, a thousand different salts, and you might not have a, a thousand different hash functions. Uh, yes, but I'm I'm failing to grasp why you would do that. Like it's not I don't I don't see the difference between the two. Yeah, I guess that there isn't one other than <laughs> you use one hash function instead of 100. But uh, well, yeah, I mean, hash functions are fairly cheap, so. Seems like in this particular case, depending on the hash function, it might be faster to compute the batch uh, in this particular case when you just bring in the positive. Yeah, so. so Uh, yeah, I don't, so my, my intuition on that would be that instead of, like, instead of having a salt that you append to each string, which is going to be sort of relatively speaking slow, whereas the hash function is really quick. So this is running, hold on, how many documents was that? I think that was 500, yeah, 500 documents from RCV1. Uh, this is just the headline, so it's like about a paragraph of text. 500 documents run through. Uh, 500 documents run through the the fingerprinting function in the LSH library. Over like that's 84 microseconds. That that's really not the part where you need to be worried about kind of speed improvement. So this so internally this uses. Uh, the murmur hash three library, uh, and you can get 32 or 64 bit hashes out of that depending on how many documents you have and like how big a hash space you want. But murmur hash is all written in C, uh, and all of the shingling logic here is also written in Cython, which compiles down to C. So like that part is is pretty quick. Um, yeah. If anyone wants to help me parallelize the hashing fingerprinting thing. Any other questions? Um, it's, it's about lunchtime, so yeah. if now, then go eat. Okay, thanks a lot.